Good day, everybody. Today I've come with Dr. Trevor Truman uh, from the Oromia Support Group. Um, welcome, Dr. Welcome back to Infinitus Network, Dr. Trevor. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here again. Thank you. Um, so, Dr. Trevor, I would give you a chance to tell us um, again about the Oromia Support Group and yourself for some of our viewers who uh, will see your. Sure. Uh, this report for the I, first time. What's this old white man doing talking about the Romo stuff? Yeah. And I, I began working with the Romo people and the Romo Relief Association back in 1988 when training health workers. Um, and since then, I became increasingly involved with politics and human rights situation in Romia and began writing letters to people in the early 90s. And then in 1994, we set up the Aromia Support Group because very few people were talking about the human rights abuses that were going on. Um, and since then, we've written 59 reports on human rights abuses in Ethiopia. Uh, 49 of those were written up to 2013. And then the, the role of the Aromia Support Group wasn't so great then and Caro were doing all the, the heavy lifting and they were doing an ex excellent job in changing the course and direction of Ethiopia. But then of course the disaster of Abiy Ahmed arrived in 2018 and we felt that we had to start producing reports in view of all the information that was coming in about the number of killings that were accelerating since 2018. And so we've written um, 10 reports now since then. And the 10th the of those, number 59, was uh, published on the 4th of April. Um, yeah, so today uh, today we'll discuss about uh, the Oromos, uh, Oromia Support Group's report 59. Um, so in, uh, on April 4th, the OSG released its uh, 59th report in which you detailed the barbaric burning of civilians by the Ethiopian government security forces in Fano militants. Confidence Network was one of the uh, media that picked the report. Um, and the gruesome torching of him by the those affiliated with the Ethiopian uh, ruling Prosperity Party. Um, so what, what do you make of that incident? What is well, Ethiopia heading? It's, it's really so gruesome and horrid that uh, it defies description that uh, people should be behaving like that in uh, this century. Um, it, it's medieval in the, the barbarity of that, that sort of thing. and. The, the most distressing thing about it was that some of the spectators were were enjoying what they were watching. And, uh, well, that, that incident really made me very, very worried and, and very angry about the way things are going in Ethiopia. And while these atrocities are, are going on, the, the world seems to think that uh, the Oromo are the perpetrators of all this instead of the, the victims. And we get this constant um, supply of false information from Amhara media outlets and major international media which are influenced by uh, Amhara. It, it's very distressing. And distressing on two fronts because the 
what is happening is, is happening and people are getting away with it. There's impunity for these uh, gross abuses. And two, the information is being distorted and twisted against the very people who are suffering these abuses. Yeah, very much so. So, um, did you notice that a similar incident had taken place early on in the southern Oromia region um, around Guji, where the um, armed forces belonging to the Prosperity Party burned um, some people who uh, were prior, um, killed priorly? I, I had heard that uh, the practice of burning victims after they've been killed had occurred but I hadn't really got details of that um, it, it's not surprising and the all but one of the victims of this latest atrocity in uh, uh, Metical zone of Venice Angle the Muslim region um, the majority of victims there were uh, were ten were, were were killed before being put on the fire but one man was unfortunately found in a hiding in a vehicle and purely because he was too great. And he couldn't possibly have been involved with the earlier incident where a convoy had been attacked because he was in prison. And he'd been released from prison that day and found hiding in a car and they just took him out, beat him up and stuck him on top of the fire while he was still alive. Yeah, and you report you detailed that um, earlier on on that day around, um, I think it was in, in March, uh, in March around March fourth, um, if I'm um, if I'm correct. So uh, some militants in the area ambushed the Ethiopian security forces and killed. It, it was the day before. A day before. The, the day before the 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 burning incident. Yeah. Uh, a day before the burning incident. That was in incident. retaliation for that uh, attack on a convoy, which was taking workers to to work on the dam. Yeah, the, uh, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Yeah, and so I the, think the, those were Beni Shangul Gumu's uh, militants. I'm not sure, but they attacked this convoy, mm -hmm. killed uh, a major and twenty, I think, soldiers who were accompanying the convoy and three civilians. And this was in retaliation for that uh, attack. So uh, 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 they reported that they have already killed about 30 of those militants. And That's what they said. And, and then the civilians were accused of um, relaying information to those militants. But it doesn't make sense because the, the civilians were released from jail from prison on that same day absolutely and it they they killing. had no chance of any contact with the militants while in, in jail while in prison so i don't it know what justifies the burning of these people at the moment like it, it was uh, a, a killing spree a feeding frenzy and they they were presumably high on killing people who'd attacked the condor and they just went on a rampage in the village and these poor people who were Tigrayans, you know, they, they were uh, because they were Tigrayan. It's, it's, it's a very worrying signal that, that we could be heading for a genocidal uh, violence in, in Ethiopia. Yeah, so... Um, so and, and at least in a way that uh, the Ethiopian government is has recognized that the danger of uh, an out of control fano uh, can pose and i and they're beginning to see what uh, a monster they've unleashed really. yeah it, it appears that the human government security forces um, right now target the tigrayan uh, people as well as the oromo people because the same kind of incident happened in the southern part of the country in in Guji Oromia where they burned some people after the, they killed them and they they did the same thing and so it, it appears that this is a pattern and um, it, it seemed to be a policy of the Ethiopian government it doesn't seem to be an isolated incident like 
exactly the same thing was repeated in Benesh Angul Gumbus as the one that was done in Guji uh, uh, Oromia. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that it's uh, it's a policy. It's a symptom of the the depth of the racist hatred and disregard that people have for for people who are not Sam Harris. And I, I think that that's the 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 worrying feature of this. It's uh, it's it denotes a dehumanization of uh, of the opponent, which is you know, as a step on the way to genocide, as you know. Had the Ethiopian government um, taken any action against those uh, those who directly committed uh, this crime? And did you hear anything I, about that? I would not know if they had, I don't think, but I've certainly not heard of any uh, actions being taken against any members of the security forces for any of the egregious human rights abuses they perform. Yeah, you also... Let alone these, these mobs that uh, Fano and uh, the Amara region militia have, have been spearheading when they killed these people in Metagon. You also included about the uh, Karayu of Bagadas who were murdered on, early on yeah. in yeah. December in 2021. December, that was the 1st of December. Um, we had reported that in the previous... Uh, OSG report, but one or two things we didn't get quite right, and I wanted to correct um, the names and things, and also some of the details of the report and the background uh, information. And some of that has been incorporated into other articles in uh, African Arguments by Roba Bulgo, who's a, a Karayu Aroma himself, and by the Sinke Institute. Um, they published an account which is very detailed and includes the map that we included in the OSG report. Um, I, I uh, shamelessly plagiarized from all sources and tried to put as full an account as, as we've got um, on the OSG report. Because none of the other accounts have quite got all the information that we have in the, the OSG report. And I thought it was worth recording for, for posterity yeah um, and again that's very significant for several reasons um the the fact that you can attack an institution like the the gada institution which preaches nothing but peace and harmony and to do that, it strikes at the very heart of the Romo culture, that the best things about the Romo-ness are, are the Gadda sister, and to strike at that was a very, very severe and it, it's a desecration really of something that's quite uh, sacred. Um, and then to blame it on Ola which is what the government tried to do, and they almost got away with it. If they killed all 16 of those Gadda leaders and the 25 that they carted off to prison, if they killed them all, and then they could have blamed it on Ola, and we would never have had the proof that it was government-inspired. Uh, but fortunately, due to, to people escaping and due to... Mm, I don't know what sort of dispute led them to split the victims into two groups and and execute 16 of them. But uh, as it happened, a good number were detained. One of those died from torture, as you know. Um, but we can prove that this was nothing to do with Ola. And of course it wasn't. Ola would never attack uh, anything as sacred as uh, a gathering institution. And we proved we've got a testimony from a government minister saying that it was uh, an MP rather, saying that it was the Aromia Region Police Commissioner who ordered the execution from Prosperity Party headquarters in Adama. And there we have the the whole facade 
of Abbey Ashbed exposed to perpetrate abuses and then blame Ola or blame Kerr. And we have it exposed there for everybody to see. Just like it happened in Burayu, just like it happened in Shashimani and Dira after the uh, execute uh, the assassination of Artalo Rundesa. It's uh, it's become a very obvious pattern now. You abuse the Oromo, kill Oromo, blame Ola, blame Caro, and job done. You've got your victim and you've blamed them. And the Amhara media machine have been exquisitely good at doing that. Yeah, so what was surprising is that the Ethiopian government initially tried to pin it on the OLA and um, and then um, try, tried to justify why they uh, killed the Abagadas. Um, one of the uh, reasons that they mentioned was that um, their military uh, um, convoy was deployed to the area about a day before the incident. And then the OLA ambushed those uh, that convoy and killed several of them, about 11 of them. And the next day, the Ethiopian military went to Karayu, to Fantale, and, and kind of like uh, retaliated it on the Abagadas. It doesn't make any sense. The Abagadas are civilians. They are in their own neighborhood, in their own um, residence. And then they, they went and arrested them, took them to um, a jungle and killed them, about 15 of them um, on, on the spot. And then uh, they killed one of them in, in prison. The government tried to say it was not premeditated. It was just the military taking the action. But it doesn't make sense, any sense because at least one of them was arrested and he was in jail in government custody. And they knew that. But still, when he was killed, even if they knew 15 people were already killed, they didn't want to spare this uh, one person. So it all tells you that this is this was a premeditated and it was coordinated by government um, administration. And um, yeah. as witnessed by one of the um, government officials, it was coordinated by Arar Samar Daza, the Oromia um uh, commissioner yeah, yeah. The, 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 there were 14 killed in um, in the area in Anole, and uh, the other death was in custody as you say in the command post a military camp um yeah it's very plain this pattern of uh, kill and disinform. These mm -hmm. have been the two fronts. Um, Abi Ahmed has been determined to eradicate uh, Kiro, um, and now he's determined to eradicate Ola, and as you know from the recently declared war on Aromia, which uh, a security task force has. Uh, um, leaked, well, has published a document last month, which has uh, been now published by OMN and translated by the OGF group. And um, we are now currently, um, as a coalition of Aromo Advocacy and Human Rights Groups, we are currently um, writing a statement concerning this, this declared war on Ola, which we know what it would mean, it would be a Romo civilian to Yeah, so yeah, we, we have a lot of news coming out of uh, Oromia right now. The Ethiopian government has deployed um, drones and attacked civilians in Abu Nagin uh, and just la last week, killing about 15 Oromo civilians. Uh, it didn't stop there. The killing spree by the Ethiopian government has continued in North Shawa Zone, in Kuyu area, the government killed about um, four um, adults and two children. In uh, Kareyu again, they killed about three people. 
So the killing spree by the Cuban government has uh, continued. It, it is not um, going down, um, and it's not just fine. Nobody gets held accountable and, for all these crimes. We only hear we only hear of a fraction of what's going on. Um, it's only recently that it's come to light the number of people that were killed in Wallow after the uh, withdrawal of the TPLF from the area. Basically, if you're a Romo, you, you're accused of supporting the TPLF if you didn't run away. And hundreds, hundreds have been executed and just left at the side of the road and then pushed into mass graves. And very little of this information comes out. If it hadn't been for the Addis Standard Report, we wouldn't have uh, heard about the deaths of the atrocities going on there. And with the the human rights defenders that send reports from West Wallaga, we've received another of those reports recently. It was too late for the last um, OSG report, where we had their third report, but a recent one has come out, and that's now on the OSG website. But they have, uh, we've recorded, or they have recorded 238 killings now, just in five districts in West Wallaga. Now, OSG had reported a minority of the, the ones that they'd report. I think we'd reported a fifth of the ones that uh, they initially sent us a year or so ago. And you can imagine that if we're only getting one-fifth of the reports in OSG, then five times what we're recording is happening. And we've got, I think it's 3,099 killings now. These are mostly named people that we can show have been killed, and most of them are killed in a row. This is not counting the, the people killed in Tigray or, or Akbar. It's 3,100. And in 20 years of reporting, between 1992 and 2012, of the, the killings done by Mila Zanawi and his regime, uh, we had 4,500. And now we've got 3,100 within three years, less than three years. And we had one and a half times that much in 20 years before. So comparing this regime to that regime in terms of the death rate, it's uh, a huge difference. After a short transition, I'll take you back to this and um, the Ethiopian Prime Minister's stance against the Oromo use. So Trevor, um, in your report, you included a segment from uh, Milkesa Mideksa Gamachu, a uh, previous um, Prosperity Party official. In, uh, he said in June 2019, during a high-level Central Committee meeting of the Oromo Democratic Party, at uh, which I was present, Abi argued that the Kero was the number one potential threat to his power, referring to the Oromo use. Many of us were shocked by this sharp reversal. He demonized the use as an ungovernable pestilence that must be dealt with as soon as possible. He said that these unarmed Kero are more dangerous than the Oromo Liberation Army. After that meeting, Ethiopia's mainstream media opened a propaganda campaign against the Kero. A prime case of this target, uh, targeted and well orchestrated campaign was a poem read by a woman artist in the presence of the prime minister on a live feed of the Ethiopian television from the National Palace on the eve of the Ethiopian New Year in September 2019, demonizing the youth, characterizing them as menga, which means mob. And instead of condemning the hate speech, senior Abi official translated the word into Oromo as grisa, which means locust insects or wild ungovernable creatures uh, to be beaten back lest they overpower the state. So what, what do you make of this? Um, it looks like Abi Ahmed came to power through the Oromo youth struggle, but um, 
he turned back on them and he's attacking them and um in the current attack against the civilians by the drone in which uh, civ uh, civilians died the killing of Carrillo Bagadas and the continuous kill killing of civilians looks like uh, looks like it's a pattern in, in a policy in Abi's government. Um, what, what, why do you think Abi is doing this? Who is gaining from this? Um, it, it, it's been obvious to those of us who've been reporting on human rights abuses that uh, Caro have been a target for extrajudicial killings and being dragged out from jail and just shot on the street. And this has happened to Caro individuals far more than any other. And it's, uh, it was no surprise to me to find that uh, this was uh, a deliberate policy of Abiy Ahmed from the start. And when you see his rise to power, you can see why. He, he rose to power on the back of the Caro movement but had nothing to do with it. And having used it and used Team Lemma to get him to power, then he discharged and got rid of all those. He didn't need them anymore. And they are the biggest threat to him because it's a pro-democracy, uh, peaceful organization. And it had huge success. It, it's, um, it's unprecedented, really, that the success that the Caro movement had in unseating a dictatorial regime um, purely by sacrificing their lives and, and demonstrating. Now, Abiy Ahmed could not tolerate that um, because his uh, whole idea is anti-democratic. He wants to go back to the days of empire. And so it, it was quite logical that uh, somebody who has a vision of seeing himself as uh, an emperor of Ethiopia again, who will make it great again, he's got to rule with an iron fist, doesn't he? And he's got to get rid of any sort of democratic uh, forces, of which Kero has been the most potent in the whole of Africa, as far as I can see. So, so do you think the main motivation of Abi Ahmed in targeting the Oromo youth and the Oromo civilians is just to stay uh, in power or um, he has an objective of turning the Ethiopian uh, the Ethiopia to the uh, pre-1991 imperial era? Which one is most that's, important to him? Oh, that, that's the only way he'll stay in power, isn't it? He, he can only stay in power by being the dictator of Ethiopia um, and if he allows any democracy to creep in then he's down but nobody wants him there's not one state that uh, wants him and the Amaras don't want him yeah in, in your report you emphasize the role of the Amara uh, militants and the Amara militia and the final terrorists do you believe this new would deter the Amara diaspora from uh, providing material and financial support um, to the Fano terrorists? Unfortunately not, because, um, well, obviously it would help turn the tide. But uh, such is the conviction amongst um, Amhara groups that uh, they are right and everybody else is wrong that uh, some just refuse to believe the facts. And they say, well, Fano could not possibly have done that. Um, Balderas, uh, they would never um, condone this sort of atrocity, but they say Fano are, are the best things for sliced bread. Um, it's very, very difficult to persuade people who've got this blind, dogmatic, racist attitude about uh, all the people who are not Amara. It's, uh, it's, a, it's very depressing. Um, one hopes that there are forces within uh, the Amara elite who will see what's going on and, uh, and come to their senses and see that the only way of surviving in Ethiopia, and the only way of Ethiopia's survival 
is if people cooperate with each other. Uh, with that, I would like to take you uh, to a more recent news that was reported by BBC Afano Romo. Uh, and the BBC Afano Romo reported on April 21st that uh, the Fano terrorists have eradicated an Oromo town called uh, Fite Boko in Limo, uh, Galila district of East Wollaga Zone um, on January 24th in 2022 uh, did, did you hear about this news we've uh, we had a report and it was in the OSG the 59th report um, of an attack on the village Abuna Gudina I believe in, in East Wollaga and Horoguluk the village um, whether this refers to the same incident or not I don't know we've certainly seen an established pattern of ethnic cleansing going on in East Wollaga and what's been happening uh, according to Ola who've been there and areas that they've left have then found that their villages have been destroyed by Amara militia and, and Fano and they're leaving behind peasants with their throats cut this sort of thing it's, it's ethnic cleansing at its worst what's happened is that Fano and Amhara militia go over the border from Amhara region and they hold meetings in Amhara villages where they agitate local people who've been living perfectly harmoniously with the Romo relative, over Romo neighbours for years and they agitate them against the Aroma, say they're taking our ancestral land and they march on the Aroma villages and then there is fighting and then the Amhara media say that uh, uh, Aroma villages are committing genocide against Amhara villages in East Bolivia. So yeah, so now. the the BBC Afghan Romo uh, program reported um, citing some satellite images that were taken um, a day before, um, a couple of days before, like January. 16 January 25th January 28th um, the BBC confirmed that the uh, town the uh, town called Fite Boko was destroyed and on January 25th a day after the attack uh, a smoke was rising to the sky uh, as taken by a satellite image and, and so uh, this, I think, uh, was separate from the one that you reported in yeah. uh, your report yeah, 59. Separate. Yep. Yeah, but but Symphony News Net Network has also previously reported similar incidents in uh, in the East Wallaga zones in Kiramu and Amuru areas. A lot of people yes. are being killed. Um, what surprises me is that the Chippewa uh, government's Oromia branch, the Oromia regional government, has not said anything has not taken any action against these uh, militants. They continue to um, cross into Oromia, el everywhere um, where Oromia borders the Amara region. Um, recently, they crossed into Karayu and killed about 26 um, Oromia region uh, militia, militia men, um, and injured several of them. The, the Oromia regional government has not done anything about it, and um, as far as I know. So what, what do you think the Oromia, Oromia government so silent and also the Oromia regional government at some point just um, late last year, I, I believe, uh, provided about 100 million Ethiopian bird to uh, support the Amara regional government. Probably that money has been, part of that money has been being used to train and arm the Fano terrorists. What do you think is the Oromia government um, silent and um, it's not reacting to what is going on in, in the region that they govern? I can't, I can't describe any good reason to it. And I, um, no, there's no logical good reason for doing that. The all you can infer from it 
is that uh, the Oromia regional government is not in control and that the federal government is the one that's wearing the trousers. However, if you look at the this uh, directive from the the Ethiopia Security Tax Task Force that was published by OMN um, earlier this month, that admits that there are weak areas, that uh, the administration in a lot of areas is leaning towards OLA rather than the government. And it says that um, in many areas, at all levels of the administration, a security presence is needed for the administration to stay intact. In other words, they can only keep control of Aromia by maintaining these military command posts. And if this crackdown on Ola goes according to their schedule, it will affect nearly every citizen within Aromia region. So Addis Standard has um, uh, reported and several times that they found no um, militants have been armed by the Amara regional government. And the Amara regional government, of course, has come out and said we are not going to disarm Fanos. We'll train them and integrate them into the regional uh, security system. Um, again, the Balderas um, group, the, the political um, group that's based in, in the capital, also seems to have an affiliation with Fano, Fano group. The Ethiopian government has um, quite a number of uh, groups that are really affiliated with the Fano to communicate and um, uh, control um, if possible, but it doesn't seem it's working or uh, I'm not sure whether they have tried this route, but um, it's if they are part of basically they are part of the Amara regional security uh, forces and also they are affiliated with the Baldras um, Baldras group by uh, that's led by Eskender Naga uh, who advocates openly advocates for the deployment of the Fano militants into uh, Oromia and so so um, yeah I'd, I'm not going to ask you why the Oromia government did not um, have the Amara counter, the Amara uh, counterpart control the Fanos and prevent them from attacking Oromia because um, it's it's an open question and we cannot tell. Yeah. Like <laughs> they're, now they're fighting each other, of course. The federal government is. Um has killed a Fano leader, I believe, in, uh, in Amara region. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, because it, it's a monster that Abby cannot control, he can no longer control Fano, and he can no longer control even the the, the legal Amara region militia. Um, well, we will see. So, so what do you think? Why hasn't the world media picked up this, and why haven't the global powers designated the final terrorists as terrorists up to now? Well, the Amhara media machine has persuaded them to not look at the truth. Uh, remember that uh, these are connections that have been built up over the last 60, 70 years. And the Oromos are newcomers on the 60. We've got far fewer university graduates. We've got far fewer people working for international organizations, far fewer people in international media. And if everybody in those media uh, grew up with the sentiments that Amara people have about Aromo, then it's not surprising that uh, our message is not getting across. And as was said at the, the OSIC mid-year conference, where um, Mikesa Midega Yamachu gave even more surprising stuff about what um, Abiy Ahmed was up to. Um, at the OSA conference, it, it, it was quite obvious. 
Uh, with that, I, I'm coming to the end of our program today. Uh, so I will give you a chance to tell us more if, if there are any content of your report that you want your viewers, uh, out of viewers to hear about. If, uh, is, is there anything left that you want to tell our viewers? Oh, there's so much misery in the um, in the support. We didn't talk about the, the press, the 46 journalists and staffers that were arrested in 2021. Um, that includes Des Desudula, who uh, recently has um, he's had a video uh, recorded by OMN, which has been translated by OGF. And that's going on the OSC website very short, shortly. Um, no, the thing to keep an eye out for is this this war on Romo now, because this is going to, under the guise of being a war on Ola, it, it's going to be a, a war on the Romo people, and we have to be aware of the the genocidal conflict possibilities. Here. You are right on that. The Ethiopian government uh, official Fikadut uh, Sama at some point said that um, we have been unable to defeat the Oromo Liberation Army because they are hosted by the Oromo civilians and they reside in the civilians. During the daytime, they hide in the jungle. They During the uh, nighttime, they come out and attack us. And we cannot differentiate them from the population, he said. And so he said, we have the policy of um, to cut the fish, fish, to eliminate the fish draw of the sea. And with that, yeah, he yeah, means... To catch the fish, yeah. Yep. That was said over a year ago, I think. Yes, exactly. The, um, but this directive from the task force was published just last month. And it says that we want to eliminate Ola once and for all so that it can never resurface and that we're going to eliminate the, um, the its associates, in other words, all of its supporters. Unfortunately for them, they are not succeeding. It doesn't seem that they are succeeding in that. They, it's uh, almost about a month right now since they have deployed um, a military from the Ethiopian National Defense Force, Eritrea uh, troops. Amara Regional Forces, uh, Oromia Regional Forces, Oromia Police, Amara Police, Fano from uh, Somalia Regional State Forces, uh, Southern Nations and Nationalist People's Forces to Oromia, but they they have uh, they haven't had any upper hand up to now, um, according to the news uh, we have been receiving from the uh, field. Um, just this week, uh, the Oromo Liberation Army that's operating in Central. Shawa um, announced that it killed a colonel that belongs to the Prosperity Party forces uh, by the name Dejani Mulgeta. Um, uh, they also killed several of the uh, Prosperity Party forces. The drone attack against the civilians that uh, killed fi about 15 in Abu Nagandabarat was also in retaliation to that. And so it seems like the Abi Ahmad campaign against the Oromo Liberation Front is not succeeding in Oromia. So um, whenever they, they are not getting what they wanted to accomplish in Oromia, they are taking it on the public, on the civilians, um, almost to fulfill uh, what Fikaru Tasama had said a year ago. Yep. I agree. It's, um, there are hopeful signs in terms of uh, there are hopeful signs of uh, dialogue going in the right direction from what we hear of uh, Ola and other people. But um, it's, it's a very worrying situation. We need everybody to work hard to make sure the international community is made aware of, uh, of the real um, way forward for peace uh, in Ethiopia. All right, Dr. Trevor, thank you very much for your time and for um, you. for your you. informing our um, audience about what is going on in, in Ethiopia. We expect you would be publishing more news and more um, reports on Oromia in your 
report number 60 when do we expect that this would be by the I, way my last question hopefully quicker than the last one I, the last one took ages to write and uh, yes it, it's overwhelming sometimes but i hope to be a bit quicker with the next one, than this last one. thank you dr trevor thank you very much daniel